Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to revisit VOR navigation. I've noticed there's been a kind of an interest in this recently, and I thought it'd be worthwhile to throw together a pretty quick video, just kind of going over some of the basics of it, as well as some tips to kind of get the best out of it uh, when you're navigating it. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So the first things first, uh, whenever you're working with a VOR navigation, uh, you need to do a little bit of handy work on the uh, part of navigation, kind of preparing for everything. So what I will do real quickly is I'll go ahead and I'll switch over to my desktop view here so you can show what to see. So currently we're sitting here at lovely Elizabeth Field. Uh, this is a Zero Bravo 8. It's on Fisher's Island. This is a crazy little teeny tiny runway. And what we're going to do today is we're going to do a little bit of fancy navigation to get ourselves up to Hartford so that we can safely land the plane. Now, one thing I notice um, whenever you're working with any sort of VOR is they're always neatly listed on the little chart but uh, for those of you who really like sky vector i always like to flip to world high mode and like you can see every vor in existence as a giant circle which makes it incredibly simple to see as far as making your plans now like i said we're interested in flying up to hartford which is uh, located here and we know that there's a vor that's not too too far this is called the hartford vor the reason by the way it's in black here is this is one of those old school ones that's just really really high up and easy to detect so we know that its frequency is 114.9 or zero. We also have its uh, latitude and longitude should be needed. And we also know that since we're taking off from Elizabeth Field here, if we wanted to travel towards Hartford, we're probably going to have to take a radial that's going to bring us up in, let's call it roughly a northwest direction. With that information in the back of our head, we have enough information to go ahead and basically start off our navigation here. So let me go ahead and I'll put this back to VFR mode. Go ahead and hide that sucker, and we'll come back to that a little later on. So we have the G1000 uh, Cessna 172 here, just to make our lives a little bit simpler. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop up here. I'm going to go ahead and set this to 11490, and I'm going to go ahead and press the swap button. It should automatically identify it, which it does, because we're close enough. Now you'll notice my little HSI here did not update. Now the reason it did not update is we're not on the correct mode. So what I actually have to do is come down here to CDI, tap that button, and it's going to go ahead and say, oh, we are on VOR1. Now remember when we did our calculations, we expect to be heading roughly northwest in order to safely get ourselves over to Hartford, which means that this green arrow is pointing roughly where we expect, we probably have selected the correct radial. In this case, it's the tree 28 radial. So the next thing I like to do is I like to go ahead and set my heading bug so that it matches whatever my course is. By the way, in the real world, the course of a VOR is not necessarily magnetically accurate because the VORs are only accurate when they're constructed. So keep in mind that my heading, even though there's no wind, and my course may not be the same thing because of magnetic variation. It's just one of those little fun things that if you want to try to trip up a flight instructor with. So we have this, everything's ready to go. All we have to do is take off and start making our way in this general direction. So we're going to go ahead and do that. However, though, I want to make things a little bit trickier for us because I want, again, this is general tips as well. So let's flip back over to my desktop mode. I also know there happens to be a VOR down here. There's uh, this one right here. This one is called the Norwich VOR, which has a frequency of 110.0. What I really want to do is I want to fly to the Norwich VOR, cross it, and then grab onto the Hartford VOR, kind of doing a little bit of a zigzag. So let's go ahead and plan that out real quick, just so we can see what this is going to look like visually. And then we'll go ahead and uh, proceed on a little flight. Ah, now things get a little bit more tricky for us. So this is going to give us the opportunity to fly away from a VOR as well as fly towards one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off, pop up here, zing zing over there, and we'll go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and get the Norwich VOR pre-programmed as well. Swing this over to 110.00, I believe is what it was. Snap that, it should say ORW, which it does. And now what I'm gonna do is, and now that I've got Hartford ready to go for later, what I'm actually gonna do is take advantage of my second navigation radio. This is a great tip, by the way, is I can come up here, set this one to Hartford, and now I know that if I wanted to track Hartford's VOR, I can actually come down to my PFD, go to bearing one mode, and set this to nav two. So now I can visually see at all times the relationship between me and that other VOR. So like I said, we're going to head ourselves kind of up north here towards the Norwich VOR. So I'm going to go ahead and crank this thing a couple times until I can see where that's going to be. And it looks like we're going to have to put ourselves on a heading of about 18 degrees in order to safely get there. Now the cool thing is, if you want to be a real hacker with both these things showing at the same time, when this this particular needle is pointing towards 396 when this white blue needle crosses the 300 mathematically we should be on the radial that we actually need to follow on to Hartford so this is an absolutely wonderful way to go ahead and make it so that it's going to be a little bit simpler for us as far as navigation later on is concerned so let's go ahead and uh, stop talking and get flying so I'm going to go ahead and do this right here do one of these full power we're going to get ahead and get rolling here 
Love the moon, by the way. Uh, that's accurate phases. Uh, we just got bad full moon, and man, has it been an exciting week. I don't know about you folks, but uh, man, it's it, it, it's been interesting. <laughs> now, one of the things is, is in the real world, when it came flying in here once, I was blown away by the fact you can literally smell the salt and the sea it, basically right on the edge of everything as you start to get airborne here. All right, so now we need to make our way towards the Norwich VOR. Now, remember, a VOR is going to be accurate only when you get close to it. Now, VOR is considered to be accurate within a degree. Now, if you think about it, one degree, if I'm one mile away from something, is actually a pretty small distance. But once you start going farther and farther and farther away from the VOR, that one degree becomes progressively wider. Another way to think about it is at 60 nautical miles from the VOR station, one degree is the equivalent of one entire nautical mile wide, which means if you're at 120, it would be two nautical miles wide. Now, in the real world, VOR stations are at the mercy of all sorts of electromagnetic interference that you're going to be running into on a daily basis. It's even possible to actually not be able to connect up with a VOR station if you are too darn close to it, or there's too many people connecting to it in the case of a DMA. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself a couple blasts of up trim here. And let's go ahead and get ourselves situated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch on the autopilot flight. And I'm going to go ahead to the navigation button. It should automatically grab onto that sucker. We're going to go ahead and set ourselves a top altitude of about 3,000 feet. Yes, I noticed the fact that it just went down. Give ourselves a vertical speed of about, let's call it 500 feet per minute. So one of the hardest parts that most people encounter when they're tracking a VOR is staying with this line centered. Remember, if you point right at it and there's any wind coming from the, your left or right side, it is going to cause the needle to deflect itself opposite. As a matter of fact, just for the purposes of demonstration, I'll go ahead and click up here. We've got this nice relaxing. Let's go ahead and create a wind at tree zero zero. And we'll do tree zero zero ish. We'll go ahead and jack that wind up to, let's make it a proper wind here. We'll do 30 knots of wind here. And we'll go ahead and take the gusts and we'll make the gusts to zero because uh, we don't need any gusts. This is demonstration purposes here. So now that we have an incredibly strong wind, we have to point ourselves towards this direction in order to keep ourselves on this course with this particular needle centered. As a matter of fact, if you look down at the water, the water's out looking a little grumpy right now. Go ahead and spin myself around real quickly so you can see just how sideways my airplane is having to fly. So one of the challenges people first encounter is trying to figure out how far to the left we need to fly ourselves in order to keep it. The trick there is to experiment with the VOR until the needle stops moving. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, take over manual control for a second here. I'm going to go flip on the heading hold mode. Whole aircraft is going to come swinging to the right. There it goes. And because of that extremely strong wind coming out of our left here, it shouldn't take too long for it to blow us off course. As a matter of fact, you can already start to see the VOR needle starting to hike in this general direction. So we're going to go, what? And the longer we fly, of course, uh, we're going to end up drifting even more where this needle is going to come through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go speed up time just a teeny tiny bit so we can make this effect multiply by a little time. Yeah, there it goes. And by the way, the closer you get to the VOR station, the more aggressively this will shift on you. So now, okay, obviously we can't point right at this station because the wind is too strong. How far to the left do we need to push? Well, generally what I like to do is I like to start by going 10 degrees to the left. So I notice my course here is 18 degrees. My heading is um, 18. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my heading. I'm going to bring it to 8 degrees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go swing ourselves. Ooh, look at how far off we are course now. Yikes. That's uh, almost borderline not acceptable for the practical test standards. So I'm going to let the aircraft bounce around a teeny tiny bit. By the way, if you know what the wind is exactly, you can calculate this number to you know, the nearest decimal point, so to speak. There we go, kind of swing it this way. Again, I thought I disabled the gusts, but apparently the gusts want to disable me. So let's go ahead and uh, set our gusts from 299 also. So that way, mathematically, it should become at least the same direction. All right, so I'm going to go speed up time again. And now what we're going to do is just watch the needle. We're not interested in centering the needle now. We're just interested in watching what the needle does. So speed up time a little bit. Do you see how the needle is still shifting to the left? That means that our 10 degree correction was not enough of a correction to be able to correct it. So what I like to do then is I like to add on another five degrees. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring myself to three degrees. So let's go let the aircraft go ahead and clean itself up a little bit here. And let's see if this needle continues to move. Ah, see how the needle is continually hiking to the left. So that means even at a 15 degree correction, this is not enough. So then what I do is I would add on another five degrees. So this is gonna bring us to tree five eight. By the way, you want to keep an eye on the DME distance here. I notice I'm about 10 nautical miles away from that DME, which is very close. So I'll go ahead and speed up time again. And now watch that needle. 
All right, now if you probably observed, this needle did not move at all, which means we have found the amount of correction we're going to need to go ahead and make it so the aircraft can fly on that radial. Keep in mind, in the real world, you got plenty of stuff to do other than this. So in that case, that means we need to bring ourselves further to the left in order to recenter ourselves on the course. So I'm going to go ahead and add myself another five degrees, which brings me on tree five three. So I know that my total correction is going to be right around almost 20 degrees, probably closer to 17 if I had to do the math in my head. So let's go ahead and wait for it to center. See how it centers? It centers just about now. Now, the interesting thing is now that we've found ourselves correctly on the right track, we are overcompensating because we're basically pushing too far into the wind because of what the aircraft is doing. So what I would do now is now that I got it recentered is I bring ourselves back to the original wind correction angle, which like I said, is about 258 what it ended up being. Now, the interesting thing is you can flip this over to the automatic pilot to try to work this out for you as well. The automatic pilot usually does a pretty darn good job of trying to center it. But one of the dangers of autopilot with BOR is because of the inaccuracy and the width of the beam, your aircraft tends to do exactly what my mouse is doing. And that can be very, very, very annoying. And it's actually going to add distance onto your trip. Okay, so I know I'm just about over the correct VOR. Now notice it's actually swinging to the right. So I'm actually going to have to overcorrect it. So I'll bring myself back to my original 15 degree correction here. Again, this is the world's slowest autopilot. Autopilots are usually much more aggressive than that. But you can see how much work it was to try to identify exactly what we needed to do in order to go to it. All right, so now here's our next problem. I'll go ahead and pause things for just a moment so we can do it. So we're going to want to transfer to the Hartford VOR. By the way, I should probably drop my RPM down. We're not supposed to be cruising at that. We can do 2600 at the maximum in a Cessna 172. We're not supposed to be doing 2500. Or 2750, I should say. Whoa. What is, oh, no. Engine failure. Engine failure. Oh, no. <laughs> they broke it, did it? Oh, no. The mixture bug has found me. Well, that was fun. I guess that's a big report over to Microsoft. You all have fun with that one. <laughs> so the short version is, whatever you do, don't press the automatic mixture button. You're going to have to do it by hand from now on. Oh, oh, well, I guess I'll have to fly like a real pilot. All right, so um, just like I was saying before, you know, we've gotten everything. We're just about to, ready to hit our you know, first little target here. We're just a few nautical miles away. Actually, flip on bearing. You can see I'm hitting three. All right, let's go ahead and pause and I'll fix up what we have here. So now what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to switch over to the Hartford VOR. Now, if you remember, the first thing we needed to do was to identify what bearing we needed. We calculated the bearing was about 29 or 8 or so, which means that's going to be the new place we're going to go. Now, one of the great things about G1000s is I can do this nasty trick. I can actually come down here, press the CDI button, and switch to VOR2 as my navigational source. Haha, <laughs> it's like cheating. So now, of course, if I come in here and I start tweaking what my course is, it will give me the ability to go ahead and select it. So now here's the part that's going to get annoying and I think you folks are going to be like what notice I can crank this thing all afternoon but uh, it doesn't do anything good to me but I'm sitting here cranking away on my little uh, CDI control and you're noticing it works perfectly fine however if you have a key bound to it remember that that key will not work properly so let's go ahead and pick my th two nine or eight so here's what's going to happen. Our aircraft now is approaching this particular course, and we're approaching it very quickly. So where do I need to point my plane in such a way that's going to enable me to be able to go onto it? Now keep in mind, we rotate this aircraft up pretty darn quickly inside the air. So if we took an extremely strong steep turn, we'd probably line ourselves up perfectly. But that's not really what I want to demonstrate. And so what I'm going to do is I'm intentionally going to pick the wrong course. Now let's go ahead and unpause real quickly here. Now here's the question. Let's go ahead and switch to heading hold, by the way. We'll hold ourselves at due north. Where do I need to point the plane so that it can smoothly intercept this particular radial? Well, the trick here is if you take a look at how far away the course line is from where you are, you can use that as a way to determine what you need to go ahead and do to that effect. Switch back to heading select. There we go. <laughs> Autopilot off. And we're back in business. Delightful. So what we need to know is we need to know exactly how far we need to point the plane in order to get safely onto this line. So the rule I always use is I do it by sectors. If the line is all the way here off to the right, as it hasn't even started deflecting past the, cir past the cir circle, what I like to do is I like to aim anywhere from straight up at it down to here. If I notice that this particular line is about halfway down, what I do is I take half of the sector. So if you take a look, this line right now is just showing up on the halfway position here. So when I go ahead and pick the 
heading I need to intercept it, what I will do is I'll now take half of that 20 degree, or 40, I'm sorry, 90 degree sector, which will put us on a course of about tree, tree zero. So now what we're doing is instead of pointing right at the radial we're interested in, we're actually hitting it at a bit of an angle. Now keep in mind, because of that ridiculously strong wind that we're dealing with from before, even though we are approaching it, we're actually going to be traveling very, very slowly towards it. So what people will do is they'll wait to kind of take half of the sector until they get themselves a little bit closer. So I'll go speed up time a little bit here. All right, I can take a look and I can see now we're exactly one dot away from the center. So now what I like to do is I like to bring myself a little bit closer to my desired course. Uh, one thing I will do for us real fast is I'll clean this up a little bit to make it a little bit easier to see what's going on here. Go away, get, get, go away. All right, perfect. Now we can see it very clear. And you can see that as we approach it, we need to turn the plane more towards it. So I'm gonna wait until I'm about half a click away and I'm gonna bring myself within 15 degrees of it. Speed up time a tiny bit. And you can see I'm exactly about half a click away, like I said. So what I'm gonna do now, that's not a click of distance, and I'm gonna go ahead and take half of that sector. So if I was originally at 90 degrees, I went down to 44 degrees, and now we're gonna be about 22 and a half degrees away from where we expect the course to be. So I'm gonna continue my little rotation here, and now we're just going to monitor that needle. Now remember, if we have an extremely strong wind, this needle might freeze in this position, which means all we did is discover how much we need to put the nose into the wind in order to go ahead and get us straight here. So good, speed up time again. You can see that needle is almost perfectly centered, and it is perfectly centered. So now what I like to do is I like to go ahead and bring myself over to the heading of the particular radial. So I'm going to go ahead and point myself right over to the uh, 289 degrees, which is the same as my course. The aircraft will come swinging around. And now what we're going to do is we're going to see what the needle has a tendency to do as we're traveling towards the target. So one thing I notice right away is I need to come slightly to my left because the needle has already started to deviate a little bit here. So give myself a couple clicks to the left. Speed up time a little bit so we can watch the effect. Now, what does those two clicks left do? Mm, not much. So I'll give myself a couple more clicks to the left. Yeah, a couple more. You can see we have a pretty significant win out of the north. See how the needle is centered? Give myself a couple clicks to the right. I'll bring ourselves back on course. Yeah, a couple more. And you can see because we are so far away, that needle responds so, so, so slowly. And now I've got myself more or less right back on the correct course that I needed to be. One thing I will do, though, is I'll reduce my RPM. Like I said, you're not supposed to be traveling at 2,600 RPM with this. Now, another thing we can do, of course, is we can allow the navigation autopilot to kick in. If we do want to do that, we absolutely have to make sure that we have the correct CDI selected. In this case, VOR2, because we're doing off the hard for VOR. So notice, we can still monitor what's going on with Norwich there. Speed up time a little bit. And you can see the aircraft ends up centering itself roughly on that needle. Notice it's not perfectly centered on that line. It is not a GPS course. It is not GPSS. It's nothing like that that we're actually going to be using here. It's just going to be that raw radio frequency that's going to be giving us that information. So your aircraft, like I said earlier, is going to do one of these. All right, hopefully that helps uh, demystify uh, some of the things with uh, VOR. We had an interesting new glitch. Uh, we've already told Microsoft about it to kind of get them a heads up. Hey, look what you've done. Look what you've done. But hopefully this encourages you to try VOR out. It uh, makes things much more exciting for you. Obviously, a human's going to be a little bit more aggressive with the adjustments here. One thing to remember, though, is if you're really, really far away, this needle is going to be slow. Also notice, if you're traveling very, very, very fast, the needle is going to be moving very, very quick. Another thing worth mentioning real quickly here, too, is that we have DME, which gives us the ability to determine exactly how far away we are from something, in which case, we're right about to fly over the top of this VR station. So actually speed up time real quick. Ready for the wiggle, ready for the wiggle. Here it comes. There it goes. Notice we got a no data. The reason we got a no data is we just flew over the top of it. And it's actually kind of fun because you can literally see it. There it is. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, hopefully this is helpful as far as encouraging you to try out VOR. Again, those are my general tricks for it. Everybody has kind of their own sort of way. Once you kind of get the hang of it, it's really not too bad. But it's like I said, it's not going to be as accurate as GPS and it's not available everywhere. Enjoy.